Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Lynn O'Hara and I'm the Director of Programs for National History Day. We are so excited to be here with our Ask an NEH Expert series to talk a little bit about papers. Now, I have to admit I have a soft spot for my paper writers. I was an NHD paper writer as a student. And this is the time of year where many of you are writing your papers, revising them, maybe trying to add to them or edit them down. And so we've got some experts here today to help give you some tips and suggestions. So we've got John Valadez. You'll hear more about him later. Um, you also have Courtney Hobson. Courtney is one of our coordinators of National History Day in Maryland. So you're going to get lots of tips and tricks to help you revise your paper, whether you're getting it ready for a school contest, a regional contest, an affiliate contest, and maybe if you get lucky, the NHD National Contest. But to get us started today, I'd like to turn things over to Julia Wynn from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Hi, Julia. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Lynn. And welcome to our Ask the NEH Expert video series. Before we get started, I want to say just a few words about NEH, who we are, and what we do. So the National Endowment for the Humanities is a federal grant-making agency. We fund research, preservation, and education in the humanities. And certainly, history is an important part of the humanities. Uh, NEH also supports a wide range of activities that could include, for example, the creation of documentary films, museum exhibitions, and books and articles. We have a long history with National History Day. We have supported History Day since its founding in the 1970s, and we continue to support the first place NEH Scholar Medals at the National Contest. We also have a special prize at the National Contest for excellent use of the historic newspapers found in Chronicling America. If you don't know about Chronicling America, it is a free online database that includes over 11 million pages of digitized historic American newspapers housed on the Library of Congress website. We also have Edcitement, which is our education website and it's a really important resource for teachers and students. Excitement has hundreds of lesson plans, student activities, uh, as well as links to vetted humanities websites. These are websites that have been reviewed uh, by teachers and by scholars for accuracy and educational value. Uh, Excitement also has uh, lesson plans and features specifically geared for National History Day teachers and students, as well as lesson plans uh, created for Chronicling America. One other resource we have available for teachers uh, are the summer programs that we offer every year. These are summer professional development programs where teachers come from around the country to study uh, a humanities topic really intensively. All information about all of this can be found on our website, which is neh.gov, and it's a great place to just explore who we are and some of the things that we fund. Uh, so now it is my pleasure to introduce our uh, presenter, John Valdez. He is a Peabody award-winning filmmaker who has written, directed, and produced many nationally broadcast documentary films. Uh, his films have tackled such diverse subjects as the false imprisonment of a leader of the Black Panther Party, Latino poet, poets in New York City, gang kids in Chicago, the history of affirmative action, segregation in America's schools, Latinos in World War II, the evolution of Ch Chicano music, uh, Latino civil rights, and the genocide of Native Americans in Southwest. So he uh, has, has been active in a number of different spheres. And John also teaches at Michigan State University. So thanks for joining us, John. Oh, hey, thank you so much. What an what a, what a intro. All right, John, thank you so much for joining us today. We're very excited to have you. We talk a lot that every NHD student is a writer, whether they're writing a paper or writing a documentary script or text for an exhibit board. It doesn't matter, it's, it's writing. Can you talk a little bit about what you love about writing? What do I love about writing? Well, you know, first thing I should say is that writing is an art form. Um, it's like uh, sculpting, it's like painting, it's like, uh, it's like music. Um, it's, uh, writing is thinking. If you can't write, if you can't take your ideas and put them on paper, um, in a way that is compelling, 
in a way that's innovative, in a way that's fresh, in a way that's exciting, in a way that touches other people, in a way that uh, engages them um, physically and emotionally. If you can't do that, um, you're probably having trouble thinking. Okay, it's a way of organizing your thoughts in, uh, in a powerful way that can reach out to the world. And um, so, I, you know, I find it really exciting. Um, I think it's really hard. I struggle with it. It's, um, I, you know, it's, it's the hardest thing in the world. I mean, I kind of, I, I have a love-hate relationship with it. On the one hand, when, 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 when you successfully put something down on paper that's really well-crafted and it's beautiful and it's lyrical and it, and it says something fresh and exciting, it's, that, that's really great. Uh, but the process of getting there is agonizing, and um, and and I gotta say, I mean, I, I I hate it because it's painful. So writing's not an easy thing. It, it it doesn't come easy to me, and I don't think it comes easy to anybody. So if you have a hard time doing it, uh, you're totally totally normal, actually. Well, I'm really glad you said that because I think sometimes that students have the idea in, in their head that you're either a good writer or you're not a good writer. But the reality is writing is a process and you become a good writer, but nobody starts as a good writer. And point of fact, I don't think anybody's first draft is, tends to be very good when we start writing. Can you talk about some of the challenges that you face as a writer and some of the ways that you overcome those challenges? All right. Well, I mean, the first thing is, is yeah, you're right. Um, when I uh, write, let's say, uh, you know, a treatment for a film, um, the first draft is terrible. I mean, it's embarrassing. And sometimes I, I think to myself, oh, my God, what have I gotten myself into? I'm not going to be able to do this. This is just, this is, the, you know, you know, I'm going nowhere. I'm so unworthy, right? Um, but what happens is, is you have to do draft after draft after draft after draft, and you keep doing it and you keep working it, and slowly it gets better and better and better and better. Okay, I mean, that's the first thing. Um, uh, 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 the, the second thing is, is the way that I approach writing, and this may be, everybody's different, so, you know, there's not one way to do anything, but, um, which I guess is the beauty of it, but the way I approach it is, it's a story. You're telling people a story, you know, once upon a time, you know, that's what I always think of. Um, it's a story and it's going to have a beginning and a middle and an end and you're going to lead people on a journey. And in telling them that journey, um, what you're going to do is you're going to paint a portrait of a world, the world the way that you see it, the world the, wor the, world, the way you've researched it, uh, the way you experience it from the particular perspective that you inhabit based on whatever, you know, the research you've done, uh, uh, the experiences you've had, etc. cetera. And, um, and so that's kind of the fundamental approach I take. And then you don't have to worry about plagiarizing somebody else. And you don't have to worry about copying or repeating what somebody else says because you're coming at it from your point of view and nobody else really has that. And so therefore it's going to be uh, unique. And so then the trick is, is can you find out your own point of view? Can you be in touch with who you are? And I guess that's really the trick. Who are you? What do you believe? What do you value? When you look at history, there are an infinite number of facts. So you have to pick out the things that you really think are the most important, that are the most meaningful, uh, 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 that really, uh, you know, contributed uh, to shaping who we are as a country, as a people, as a community, whatever it is, um, you have to kind of kind of identify what's really important in order to weave your story because you can't you can't tell everything. You have to select. But that's what I would do. I I would think about my writing as a as a story and leading somebody, uh, you know, through. Uh, uh, you know, a series of events to getting to an ending that is, uh, you know, that, that ultimately means something and, and says something more than the sum of its pieces. 
I don't know. Does that does that make sense? I, I think it absolutely makes sense. I think you bring up a really good point about maintaining your voice and your point of view. And you know, we talk a lot about that with our students in terms of setting up their argument because their argument is what makes two papers about, you know, Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Nelson Mandela different because it's their take on it as well. Um, I wanted to ask you a question though, because sometimes, uh, especially paper writers, you sit in front of the computer screen and you've got that blinking cursor. And then sometimes it's hard because you can kind of get stuck with that writer's block or you've done a draft and you just don't know what to do. What are some suggestions you can give for students to kind of get over that hurdle, to get started or to get past a roadblock in their writing? Mm. Well, I guess the first thing that I think, you know, in, in filmmaking, um, we talk about um, what we call um, either, well, two, two, two possibilities, the hook or the promise, okay? So let's, let's talk maybe just about the hook. So the first thing I would ask myself if I'm going to sit down and I'm going to write something about some historical figure, right? Um, uh, what is it, I would ask myself, what is it about this person that I think is interesting? What is it about this person that I think is, is, is compelling, that gets me excited? And if there's something about that person that gets me excited, there's a chance it might get other people excited. And then the second question is, is to ask yourself, is there uh, a point in this person's life where they were confronted, um, uh, uh, when they were confronted or challenged or faced a moment of drama in their life, right? So that's what I would do is I would start out with the most exciting thing that I could find and see if that's a kind of a metaphor for the entire story right so um and then that will get hopefully if it's exciting it'll get people hooked because the, what you don't want to happen is someone to start off reading and within four sentences they're bored because then they're not going to keep reading right but if you start with something that is um engaging uh dramatic um eye-catching um, you know, in journalism, they say, if it bleeds, it leads, okay? Very crude, but, um, but yeah, you want to you 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 have, a, have a hook. You want to, you know, if you're doing something about Abraham Lincoln, you want to start at a moment when, uh, that's, that, that, that's agonizing for him when the, when, the, when the fate of the nation lies in the balance and the pressure's on him and he has to decide something right or you want to start with um you know somebody you want you know if, uh, you know if you're doing something on dr king you want to pick a a moment maybe where something really really dramatic happened where he was at a crossroads and that crossroads for him is probably a crossroads for the nation and so now you're starting to talk about telling a story that is a literal story but then there's also a metaphor that's going on underneath it all wrapped in drama and all of it true and factual at the same time and when you start having those things all going on wow then you start getting some some magic going i don't know is that helpful i, I think that's <laughs> Very helpful. And actually, this is going to bridge me into my question for Courtney. So thanks for the nice setup. Um, you know, one of the things we talk about is that you have to have a little bit of historical context. Dr. Gordon likes to say, no context, no contest. But, you know, sometimes it's hard because you, you start with that hook. You've got that exciting moment. And then you start to kind of give the background. But sometimes the background becomes like a little bit of a rabbit hole where you know you just keep writing and writing and writing and let me tell you about this person and this is how they grew up and this is their point of view but i wanted to ask you courtney how much of the paper should be background information and how much should be really focused on the theme and the argument that you're putting forward what suggestions can you give our students well um first i would remind students that uh, paper is 1500 to 2500 words so you it might seem like you have a lot of words to work with but you want to make sure that you delegate those words carefully so for background information i would suggest um two paragraphs 
maybe three. Sometimes it depends on your topic. There might be some topics that don't require a lot of background information or context. So if you're writing about Martin Luther King or Rosa Parks, for instance, your reader might not need as much background information as that's general knowledge. However, if you're writing about, say, an international topic that your reader might not be familiar with, you might want to add an additional paragraph of context. Um, but most of the majority of your paper should be focusing on proving your thesis and also um, connecting to the theme. One of the keys that our students have to learn, and the paper students I think really, really have to learn it the best, is how to properly use footnotes or citations. Um, can you talk a little bit about what students can do, what you suggest to students, and kind of what, what ways they can make sure that they are, you know, when they're writing, they're using their history and their research responsibly and avoiding what I call plagiarism jail. We don't want to go there. <laughs> yes, plagiarism is a no-no in History Day land. Um, so History Day requires um, two, one of two uh, citation uh, styles. That is Chicago or MLA. Now you might also hear another word thrown out which is Turabian, and Turabian is just a, a style, a condensed version of Chicago. So they are some, they are the same style format, so don't be confused by that. Um, however, when you're writing your paper, choose one of those styles, be consistent. Um, we do not suggest switching between Chicago and MLA format in the midst of your paper. Um, and footnotes and or endnotes are also acceptable, as well as in text citations in the MLA style. However, as um, someone who is trained as a historian, um, most historians use Chicago Turabian style. And as far as uh, preference of footnotes over endnotes, I would actually suggest footnotes because it's very helpful for your reader if they're reading something and they want to know, hmm, I wonder where they got that information from. They can just go right to the bottom of the page and look at that footnote instead of having to turn the page to the endnotes to figure out where exactly you got the information from. And as far as keeping track of your citations and your footnotes, um, Noodle Tools is a great uh, tool available to History Day students to kind of keep track of your citations. And also just write everything down, even if you don't have access to new tools, just make sure that you uh, get down all the information that you need from a source when you get your hands on it. I think too, sometimes, you know, you end up with these sources that you're not quite sure what they are. This is where you want to ask. Bring in your English teachers, bring in your librarians. I guarantee you, if you go to a librarian and say, I have this source and I'm not sure how to cite it, I'll bet you that that person is the person who can absolutely help you. We also have a resource on our website, so nhd.org slash bibresource, that can kind of help and take you through and show you lots of examples and how to cite lots of most, the most common times of, types of documents that NHD students get. Um, I have one more question for you, Courtney, that I want to switch back to John here. We get a lot of questions about what is in an appendix? Can you use it? Can you not use it? when you use it. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that is used in a paper? Okay, so an appendix is a section of additional information that typically comes at the end of your paper. It's information that might otherwise clutter up your paper and burden your reader, but it's information that is kind of um, good to know and might enhance the reader's experience of what they're enjoying. So for example, if you're writing a paper about Andy Warhol and the pop art movement, um, you might want to include images of um, Andy Warhol's artwork at the end of your paper just so that the reader gets an idea as to what uh, pop art is if they've never seen it before. Um, however, this information should always be relevant to the paper that you're writing. Um, so do not add information that uh, otherwise the person reading is like, what on earth is this doing here? So make sure that the information is relevant. Um, as far as when to use it, um, I think in the case of topics where visual imagery is very helpful in telling a story, that's a good place. Um, sometimes if you have an interesting artifact or document that you want to showcase, um, putting in an appendix would be good. The one thing I would advise in putting documents is um, make sure it's an image of something that's legible. If you're putting a, a picture of a document at an appendix and it's not legible to your um, to your reader or your judge, it's kind of has a, it's kind of useless at that 
at that point. So make sure that everything that you are putting at your appendix, you clearly label and it's and it's um, legible. Um, now, judges do look at the appendix. I was a judge before I was a coordinator. However, the appendix should not influence them. They are evaluating the body of your work. So while an appendix is nice, it is not necessary for a paper. Well, I think it's kind of like a prop and a performance. If it makes sense and should be there, sure, you can use it. But don't put, you know, a telephone and 10 things on the table that you're not going to use and don't really need to show your character. And I think it's kind of the same rule with an appendix. Let me switch back to John here for a second. And, and so a lot of our students, they've got their hook, they've got their thesis statement, they tell their story, they make their case, and then they get to the conclusion and they kind of get stuck. Can you give some tips to our students for coming up with good ways to conclude a paper? Okay. Well, let's be you know clear on something because um, you know you know there's different kinds of writing and different kinds of papers that you can write. Okay. So I guess you know my preference, you know, um, is for uh, 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 writing that is going to, like I said, um, tell a story and that the, um, I guess the, the thesis or the argument is embedded in the story, right? Because when I make a film, you know, about history, um, uh, it has to reach a broad audience and it, and it, and it has to be for, for people who aren't necessarily historians or they may not be familiar with, with the history. They may not even care right um but what you know but what i want to do is i want to get them to care and i want to get them drawn in so i think as you wind up your your story what i my approach would be um to try to uh uh, uh bring the story to a meaningful conclusion and as you do it weave into it uh, 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 a reminder of the broader themes that you're dealing with and touch on whatever the thesis is that you have at the beginning so that there's a feeling of it being full circle without it hitting people over the head and um, directly hitting it on the point. Um, I know that's very uh, abstract. But um, but I would preference story and um, and engagement, and then use that as the lever to then bring in um, the history and the thesis underneath it. So I you know I don't know if that answers your question. I I, I wonder if maybe um, I'm trying to think of a more explicit uh, example of of you know of, of you know of how to do that. Um, well, I'll give you an example. Okay, okay. So I did, uh, so I did a film um, that was about, uh, about the birth of Mexican-American civil rights. And it was really the story, right, of um, we were going to tell the story of Mexican-American civil rights, but the way I was going to do it is I was going to, is it was going to be about the relationship between two people. This guy, Hector P. Garcia, who is a Mexican-American uh, activist, and Lyndon Johnson who was the president of the United States and their love-hate relationship, how they, how they adored and admired each other, but they also were constantly feuding and, um, and, uh, and, and, and in some ways hated each other at the same time. And that this relationship over time helped forge civil rights in ways that uh, are very unexpected and that most Americans don't know about, but that shaped the lives of millions of people, okay? So by the time I get to the end, right, of the story, uh, Johnson signs the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and I end by saying, I, you know, by, by telling the viewer, uh, you know, uh, for Garcia, it was a triumph, 
right, uh, uh, was the culmination of this relationship over all of these years. And it led to Latinos being elected to uh, city council positions, uh, being judges, governors, senators all across the nation and it, you know and it led you know to the to the to the transformation of, of of millions of lives and to the reorganization of the american political system right so that's my thesis that what these guys did changed america but i'm doing it by having us at a moment where the voting rights act is signed and then i say the meaning of that so that the so that my thesis and the um, and the history are kind of like intertwined with one another. You can't. It's not like thesis over here and history over here. They're both going on at the at the same time. And I think I, I think things work best when you can when you can do that when things are doing double duty. So I don't know if that makes. sense. I think that's really helpful because what you're saying here is you're not just saying the event. So in this case, it was Johnson signing the Civil Rights Act or the Voting, or rights, voting Act. rights Act. But yeah. then you're also saying, okay, this is why this was important to this person. And that, that this is important because is really kind of helpful to our paper writers because they're trying well, to get to that analysis. Well, well, more than that, I'm saying that the signing of the Voting Rights Act uh, uh, was a triumph for Garcia. Okay, so right there in saying that, I'm saying Latinos were actually very important to civil rights. And I'm not saying I think it was, I'm saying it was, okay, as the evidence is shown throughout the story, right? It, it, was, a, it was a triumph for Garcia. It, it led to the election of Latinos to city council positions, da 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 da, da. It led to this, that, and the other thing, right? I'm not saying I believe it led. I'm not saying I think it led. I'm not saying it's my opinion it led. No, it led. You're, there, there's evidence of this, right? This is what happened. You don't know this is what happened, right? Because you probably don't know that much about Latino civil rights and how the Voting Rights Act, you know, transformed their lives as well. But I'm telling you, this is what happened, okay? And I have the evidence to, to prove it. I'm not saying here's the evidence. What I, the evidence is woven into the story. There's not a separation of the two, right? And it makes the argument, uh, if, if you make the, if, if, if you tell the story well in that manner, people will come away believing Oh my gosh, there's no other way to look at history. That is the history. Well, of course, there are a million ways to look at history. There's not one way to look at it. There are a million ways. But if, you're, but if your writing is good, people will go, oh my God, that's the history. And then if you read something by someone else, you go, no, but that's the history. No, but that's the Because you, you've told the story so well and with the evidence intertwined. And, and that's what you want to do. I don't think you want to begin separating things. They, they should all be embedded one in, you know, into another so that they can't, you can't really pull it apart. You know, and that's the, and that's, but that's hard to do. You know, it's not easy. Well, and that's the challenge, but it's great for our students to hear that you face the same challenges that they are. Let me throw out a different kind of challenge. Uh, our, our student papers have to be between 1,500 and 2,500 words. And oftentimes, like Courtney said, that sounds huge until you start writing. And sometimes you have a student who finds that they've got a paper draft that's 3,000 words or more. What are some suggestions that you can give to students while they're revising or sometimes needing to cut back a little bit in their writing? Um, I guess the first thing is, is make your sentences short, right? I mean, write simply. Um, good writing is not necessarily complicated writing. The, the, you know, the, the best writing is very clean and efficient and uh, economical. Um, uh, doesn't necessarily have to use fancy words. Because the point is, is not to uh, uh, impress somebody with how erudite you are. The point is, is to communicate and to reach somebody so that they understand what you're saying. And so uh, 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 being clear, concise, uh, simple, taking complicated ideas and boiling them down to what their essence and their meaning is 
and being very economical with your language, that's really hard to do, but that's, you know, that's really important. Um, I, you know, I guess the other thing is, is stay on point. What is the point you're trying to make? Don't go off over here, over there, over here, over there. You, you have a, uh, you're, you're on a mission. You're on a mission to communicate something. Tell your story and only your story. Um, uh, it, you know, it, it, Lyndon Johnson, well, what he did in Vietnam may be very interesting, but that's not your story. Uh, you know, uh, Mexican-American civil rights and what was happening with uh, immigration. Okay, that's, but that's a different story. Okay, maybe that's a different place. Keep on topic. Keep, it, just say what you need to say and say no more because if you start getting off track, you're going to get caught in the thickets and, and in the woods and in the brambles and you're going to, you know, you're, you're going to lose the path. So, um, yeah, so that's what I would say. Write simply, cleanly, and stay to the point that you want to make and, 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 and nothing else. I want to throw one last question your way, too. You know, we talk to students and we say, okay, when you're quoting in your papers, you should quote almost always the vast majority of quotes that you pull should be from primary sources. What are some interesting ways that you can bring a primary source into your story without writing three paragraphs about that source? Hmm. Well, the first thing is, is I wouldn't really say much about the source. That sounds like something for, you know, footnotes or endnotes, you know, where you can say where it came from, because you don't want to interrupt the story. Um, but, you know, you can say, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, you know, Lyndon Johnson had hoped that, uh, that uh, you know, that his work with Dr. Garcia um, wouldn't affect his, uh, you know, his, his, his white Southern constituency, right? Um, but Southern whites knew exactly what he had done. Um, uh, a good friend said to Johnson, quote, um, I voted for him once. I'll be damned if I'm going to vote for him again, unquote. And then you can put a little one there and then you can say where it was in the end notes and then, you know, you know, go on. And you've given an example of, of the kind of pressure Johnson faced, um, but without, you know, going into the weeds, you know, if they want to go, if people want to go in the weeds, wow, I wonder where that quote came from. Well, then you can have it in the, in the footnotes or, 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 or the end notes. But I think it's, you don't want to interrupt the story, but you want to allow for people to be able to go deeper if that interests them and if they want to track things down and they want to explore that, right? So I think that's, you know, that's the, that's, that, that's the key, right? Um, another thing, you know, uh, is like, you know, letters are always good, you know, so, you know, you know, um, uh, 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 you know, you can say, um, you know, uh, 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 you know this. The, the, you know, you, you know, you know. Bill Smith was, um, you know, had never been to Colorado, and he hadn't seen his wife in 14 years. So while he was excited to see the Rocky Mountains for the first time, and 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 he was intoxicated by the beauty uh, that you know um, he wrote. He you know he, he held private reservations, right? In a letter to his wife, dated. Um, that winter, he said, uh, you know, oh, I miss you so much. My heart is longing for you. Um, if I don't uh, come back, you know, within uh, you know, a month, surely I feel I would die, um, you know, and because I miss you so much. And this, this place is so beautiful, but it's nothing without your love right? Unquote. Okay, now you've humanized that experience, and then you can put a little thing, and people can look in the footnotes, and they can find where that letter is. It's in this book, and yada, yada, right? But you don't want to get lost in the weeds. You want that to support what you're trying to, what you're trying to say, you know? And don't make the quotes long, just enough, just barely enough to just get the job done. That's all you want to do, get the job done. You don't want to, you don't want to go any, any further. Well, I think that's really good advice because you, you're using your quotes as evidence, but you're not letting them overwhelm the paper. 
and, and actually that helps me. I want to transition to a question for Courtney here. Can you give some advice to students of when they should quote and when maybe they should just paraphrase and cite the source? Well, like John said, uh, direct quotes should be used uh, sparingly because um, remember quotes also count towards your word count. So you do not want, you know, a one long quote just sitting right in the middle of your page and you haven't said anything yourself. You want to use your words to communicate your thoughts. Um, an example I'll give to you kind of demonstrate when to quote and when to paraphrase is say you're writing about Martin Luther King and the letter from a Birmingham jail. You know, letter from a Birmingham jail is a beautifully written piece of uh, philosophical uh, thinking. And there are some quotes in there that you might want to directly quote, but you might want to take a sentence or two. Um, however, if you are, um, if you have a secondary source or a book, about the letter from Birmingham jail. You don't want to take whole chunks out of what someone else has written and just directly quote from them because that's not your original thought. So direct quotes you should probably use mostly if you are trying to quote from a primary source. Um, and paraphrasing should come from if you are, um, if you find a secondary source that's writing something that is similar to what you want to say, um, but just put it in your own words and make sure you cite it correctly. Um, that would be my my recommendation. Um, only, like I said, only direct quote. If something, if someone has written something that is so phenomenal that you cannot put it in any other words, that's my recommendation for paraphrasing versus quoting. Well, and that ties back to to what John said earlier. You don't want to lose your voice. You don't want your paper to read as here's a quote and I'm going to connect it to the next quote and connect it to the next quote. You want that voice to carry through. Okay, so my, my last question for you, Courtney, you said you served as an NHD judge. And we mm -hmm. often get the question of what sets a really good paper above a paper that's just, wow, that's really nice. What are some things or some tips you can give to students that would help kind of set their paper apart? Well, um, some of the tips are things that have been said already in this in this webinar. Um, make sure that your paper is well written and well researched. And the way that you can demonstrate that is by writing simply. Make sure that your point is clear. Um, have good citations. Make sure that you can demonstrate to the judges that you have you know done a, a great deal of research and that you've put a lot of thought into what you're writing. Um, stay on point. And most importantly, tell a story. Um, a lot of students get caught up in the um, idea of, well, this is a historical event, and so therefore it's important because it just is. You want to communicate to your judges why they should care about what you're writing, why this particular thing is important, or um, demonstrating a point that maybe, or a perspective that maybe they haven't thought about before. Um, just make sure that you are communicating as simply and as clearly as you can and it, um, with good research. And I think that is the formula to a winning paper. Okay, well, this is really wonderful advice for our NHD students. Thank you, John. Thank you, Courtney. I'm gonna go ahead and turn things back to Julia to wrap it up. Thanks, Lynn. And thanks again to John and Courtney. Um, and as a final reminder, I would just say, uh, remember that NEH offers a variety of resources to NEH, uh, NHD students and teachers, um, Chronicle America, Excitement, Professional Development Programs for Teachers, and don't forget your State Humanities Councils. Many of the State Humanities Councils are also very much involved in National History Day and can be a great resource for you. So thanks so much. Thank you, everyone, and good luck with your NHD papers.